It's great to be back with you. Uh, I've been I've been off, not at Kez for like the last four weeks, so it's great to be back here and actually with you guys. We had uh, a little sickness bug in our house, and then I had COVID, um, and I'm vaguely better now. I'm not contagious anymore, but I am uh, still feeling so tired um, and just just wiped out still. So uh, if I just kind of nod off halfway through this, just someone poke me. Um, and we should be all right. Um, and if I say anything that just feels like it's wandering off down a rabbit warren, that might be why. Or it's just, that's the way I am. Um, but as Alex has said, we are starting a new series this morning. Um, it's only a mini-series, so just three weeks. Um, but looking at some really important stuff. We're looking at the way of Jesus. Um, and then how that translates into the day of Jesus on our Sundays here together today. So have you ever heard someone say something like, he's, oh, he's just got such a way with kids? Have you ever heard that? Or like, oh, he's, like, he's got a real way with animals. They just, they just seem to listen to what he's saying. Or some, somebody, you might know someone that's like, just got a way with fixing things. Has anyone got that? Alex Walker, the, the in, in, inimitable host that we've had this morning, all he has to do is walk near a Wi-Fi router and it, and it just fixes itself. It's incredible. It's just his way. Um, Jesus had a way about him. He actually described himself as the way. Um, and, and we see that actually in the way he did things and the attitude that he carried towards others, the kind of the manner or the demeanor in which he just lived out his entire life. It was just his way of, of living, and he was the way. He said about himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in fact, in early Christianity, before it was known as Christianity, they were followers of the way. Um, that's, what, that's what Christians were called. We, they, we don't get that until later in about Acts 11. Um, and so this, this next few weeks, we've got this mini-series looking at the way of Jesus. When we see Jesus in the Gospels, what we know of him through Scripture, what is he like? What is his way with these different topics. I'm going to be talking about children. That's what we're talking about today. We're going to be talking about his way with prayer and his way with gathering people. And we're going to think specifically about what that actually then translates to for us on a Sunday, on the day of Jesus, when we come together to celebrate him, to, to meet with him, to meet with each other. What does that what does his way with things mean for how we do things together? Um, so that's kind of where we're where we're heading. Um, and then also, yeah, the kind of idea of the, that we can imitate his way. That's what it means when he says, follow me. Um, it's not kind of like follow him on Twitter or on Instagram or something. It means like, actually, follow me, imitate me, be like me. And so there's, there's stuff for us to learn from that. So like I say, this morning, we're going to be looking at the way of Jesus with children and what that means for us. And so, so here's the plan. I want us to see how kind of our society, our background, our culture, maybe even our upbringings have have somehow maybe even warped our view on children because um, it, it, it happens. And then we're going to compare that, our view, with what Jesus is saying about children, what the scripture actually has to say about children and young people. Um, and then we're going to consider, like I say, what that means for us here at Life Church, embracing and enjoying what it means to have children amongst us. Um, and not just kind of having one way of doing things, we're going to see what what the impact is of looking to Jesus and then seeing what that means for us. So I'm excited about this. To be clear, from the very outset, this isn't just for parents. Okay, this is, and if you've come with that mindset, then you need to get rid of that straight away because that is not what it's about. This is about all of us. Jesus himself actually makes it about all of us unequivocally. We'll see that a bit later on. And so for the sake of clarity, when I'm talking about children, really, my, in my head, I've got naught to 18s. Okay, so it's the full breadth of children, and then we'll kind of extend that out and even a little bit further. I know we've got an 18-year-old looking at me like, I'm not a child. We'll get to that. But you see, through, throughout the whole of history, children have either really been either disregarded, or they've been seen as a commodity, or they've been idolized. And that's... That's something we see play out through all sorts of generations. There's a guy called David Garland who's a theologian, and he writes in one of the study Bibles. Um, he says this, In the ancient world, children had no status. It's on the screen for you, I think. Um, children had no status. Back then, a person could literally throw children away by exposing unwanted infants at birth. And by exposing unwanted infants at birth, that is just, just leave them out in the open. It's just, it just, it's crazy to us to think that that is a thing. There's a famous letter written in the first century by a poor worker to his pregnant wife in Alexandria. 
and he advised her to keep, the to keep the child if it was a boy and to just cast it out if it was a girl. The unscrupulous, the unscrupulous then would collect these exposed children and some of them would gather these children and raise them to be gladiators or prostitutes. Or they would sometimes even disfigure the children to enhance their value as beggars. This was the world that Jesus lived in and was speaking into. It was a world that didn't have time for children. It's shocking, isn't it? And yet that's what Jesus is speaking into when we see what he says later. But even, even within, there's this view that children can be kind of seen as a commodity. This, kind of, this idea of having an heir to continue a line, it's just something to kind of continue my life's work, potentially. Or maybe even in a more modern sense, someone through whom to live out your broken dreams. Children as a commodity, there's, there's this idea that even today, kind of, yeah, our children are somewhat some, a vessel through which we get to have another go of doing all the things we didn't get. Or we get to do it better than our parents did for our children. And again, there's a, there's a, there's a commodification of children. There's a, there's a thing where they kind of go, okay, here's a project for me to, to, to do. I think we also live in a, in a culture today, and I think we can see this in all sorts of ways, where children and childhood, in fact, are idolized. And the Bible has plenty to say about idols. So much so that actually the idea of kind of wanting to remain as young as possible for as long as possible is kind of the highest virtue in our world today. Certainly in a Western society. You can kind of, uh, yeah, you can end up wanting to just stay youthful, look youthful, act youthful, dress youthful for far longer than it's sensible to. And, and that kind of plays out in all sorts of areas of our culture, like I say. And I think there's also a sense in which our culture ends up causing us to idolise children, whether we have children of our own or not. It's a real challenge in our culture for these things. So if you do have, your, if you do have children, children end up becoming your entire reason for living. They are everything. You'll see people on social media saying a picture with their kids and it says, my world, underneath, my everything. And even now, maybe there's a bit of you going, well, that, yeah, but that's... That's right, isn't it? Hold on, is it? I don't, I, well, I don't know. We can kind of end up then equally idolising the thought of having children if, if, we're not, if we've not got children. That that will be the thing that actually makes life all I've ever dreamed it would be. And it can be a real challenge not to idolise children. In fact, youth culture is in our world today, for the first time in human history, the dominant culture. All throughout human history, there has always been a looking to the, to the previous generation for your values, for your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations. There would be a, I want to be like them, the older people. I want to, I want to grow up to be like somebody. And yet in our world today, youth culture is actually an upstream culture. So rather than the generations and the values and everything else flowing downwards, it's actually flowing the other way. It flows from youth culture to the generations above. Let me, let me show you how this plays out. You can see it in trends on social media. Okay? So Facebook started as the place for cool young people to be. It started when I was just about at university. Okay? And Facebook was like, that was, the, that was the cool place to go and share what you were doing, share hilarious statuses and videos and pictures and things like that. And then my mum got on Facebook. So I went on Instagram. And that's, that was the cool place to share my photos and pictures and, and things about what was going on in my life. And then my mum went on Instagram. And so now young people, not younger than me, are on TikTok, maybe even right now. Because the parents aren't going to learn the dance moves. They've got no chance. And so all that happens is, is parents are looking to be part of what is the culture of my young people. And there's a good part of that, but it, it, it flows that way now rather than the other way. It, it happens in dress and fashion and all sorts of things like that. There is a, there is a, a youthening of fashion and the way that, that older people want to be because of the way that, that youth culture and the way of young people is, is influencing culture in a way that it has never done before. And so it's a, 
it's a, it's a big thing in our culture. There's an idolization of, of children, childhood, being young that, that has never been like this before. And in fact, maybe this polarizing view of kind of, uh, of childhood and children is kind of best observed through the lens of parenting and some of the trends that have developed over like the last, let's just look at the last 200 years. So 200 years ago, the rough aim of parenting was keep your child alive till they're about seven. And then they can either go and work to, to fund the family or they can continue an education if you're wealthy enough and that will further your family. That was kind of the view of parenting then. About 150 years ago, we had the Industrial Revolution, and then children became part of that. More and more children were born because we needed more and more wor workers. We needed people to, to work in the factories. And in fact, there was almost a machining of children. So regular feeding times and regular sleep times really only happened at that point because that was what needed to happen. About 100 years ago, children were kind of in that place of you need to be seen and not heard. And there was one really famous psychologist who'd been um, massively involved in the kind of the psychology and strategy of World War I, who then decided to turn his hand to parenting and how to tell you how to raise your children. And he said this really sound advice. If you must, kiss your children once on the forehead when you say goodnight. And you will soon be ashamed at the sentimental way you've been handling it. He also suggested that parents should shake off the instinct to hug their children and instead shake them by the hand. A hundred years ago. About 50 years ago, when we started to get the modern, modern parenting theories of kind of attachment and the fact that children might actually want to feel some kind of affection or love. Um, and showing them that love developed, but also, at exactly the same time, so did women's rights and women in the workplace, particularly after World War II, and, and jobs needing to be filled by things that had been left by men not being there anymore. And so what started to happen was that children needed to kind of fit in around modern life. Children had to fit in with mum being at work and not coming back until a certain point. And we kind of feel the squeeze of life happening around us. And in lots of senses, that is carried into modern life that we know today. We get that same squeeze. And so we're left with the same challenge that we've seen throughout history, that children can either become disregarded or children become idolized or children become a commodity. And it's a sobering thing. This, this idea that I, I think one of the most concerning things to me is this idea that children are a commodity, that children are somehow a social ticket into the world that we've always wanted to be part of the mums at, at school or the people who just seem to have it all together. Is, a, is it even this whole thing that's happening at the moment in, the, in front of us in the world of is it children becoming a commercial enterprise? There's a, there's a term that's been coined for this called sharenting, where your children become your source of content on your social media or your, your source of content for conversation or your source of content in your marriage and in your life. And actually, without them, what, where would we be? So is there a different way? Is there something, is there any good news in this? I want us to look at Jesus' interaction with children in the, in the Gospels. And I want us to see what we can learn from them. So if you've got a Bible, you can turn to Mark 9. If you haven't, it's going to come up on the screen, so don't worry. And I'll read it too. But Mark 9, 36 to 37 says, says um, in a second, it's, Jesus is talking to his disciples here. And they've been behaving like children frankly. They've been arguing about who's the greatest. Okay, they've been going, I'm, no, I'm the best. And they're going, no, I'm the best. And if you've got children, you'll know that that conversation happens quite regularly until you prove to them that you're the best. But it tells us here that Jesus says that he does this. He took a little child whom he placed among them and taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So, so Jesus, who is God on earth, is the full representation of God. He tells his disciples that welcoming children in his name is welcoming God. And so Jesus clearly has a high view of honoring children. He equates it with the same idea as welcoming God himself amongst them. That is a high view of children. And it, it kind of flies in the face for us of, um, of this kind of idea of having children, particularly in church on a Sunday, of 
kind of potentially just being seen as slightly getting in the way until the adults can really do church. Have you ever felt like that? I have. (laughs) But Jesus doesn't feel like that. He doesn't say that. In fact, elsewhere, Jesus gets pretty cross with the disciples um, who are stopping children being brought to him, presumably by their parents. And he says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And so there are some big things for us to see even just through these things here. Firstly, parents can bring their children to God. Parents, you can bring your children to Jesus and he actively encourages you to do so. It's a good thing to do. But it will only ever be his, his, his touch, his, his effect in their life that brings them to a knowledge of who he actually is. They can observe you. They can watch us. But it will only ever be when they come to Jesus himself, themselves, that anything dramatic will happen. It has to be his touch. It gives us the idea there as well that Jesus can them, the children themselves sorry, can want to come to Jesus too. But there's a warning for us all. There's a warning here that Jesus tells us we can hinder children coming to Jesus. We can hinder them. So it's worth just considering for a moment, what is your attitude towards children? I'm going to be a little bit provocative. Does your attitude welcome children or does it hinder children? Particularly thinking about when we're gathered together in church on a Sunday. But you can apply this wherever you want. So I'm not going to ask you to kind of tell me out loud what what your attitude towards children is. Um, But I want you to kind of examine your heart a little bit. So there'll be some indicators for what your heart is like on this. So when kids are being noisy in here and a little bit disruptive, what's what's your reaction? What does it do inside you? Does Does it make you want to throw things at them? Or throw them? What, is it, what does it do? Does it, does it make you thankful that they're in church? This is, this is the moment where we all go, mm. yes, that's my reaction every time. Does it? Does it make you think, I'm so glad their parents have made the effort to get them here, even though they're clearly not having a good morning? Or does it make you think, I really wish someone would just... What about when the, when the worship band sing a song that kind of makes you have to do something? Like an action. Or maybe several actions in a row. How does that, how does that make you feel? Do you find yourself thinking, I can't wait for the real worship to start? Do you find yourself thinking, I'm just going to find that thing in my bag. I'm just gonna, I'll just sit down for a moment. Or do you find yourself thinking... If I join in with some gusto from where I am, maybe that'll help a parent behind me whose kid doesn't want to do it. But if they see me doing it, who knows, maybe they will. Or maybe they'll just have something to laugh at. I'm not, I'm not saying any of these things are going to make you a better Christian or a better person, or they make you a terrible Christian or a bad person. But I think it reveals something in our heart towards our attitude towards children and their place in our church. Here's a, here's a tough question I've been wrestling with for quite a while now. What does it look like for us to hinder children coming to Jesus? What does that look like? I think maybe it is as simple as not doing the thing that Jesus tells us we should do, which is welcome them. We're going to have a look at another account of what Jesus says to his disciples. It's in Matthew 18. And he says this. It's the kind of same kind of conversation, but a different account. At that time, which kind of makes me think, by the way, that Jesus probably said this more than once. That's kind of what happens in the Gospels. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a little child to them, to him, and placed them among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And this is what Jesus gets. This is the kind of stuff he wish Jesus doesn't say. He says, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Jesus, don't say stuff like that. (laughs) 
But he does. So we've got to deal with it. I think it's the same idea, isn't it, as hindering a child, right? But it's more forceful, isn't it? It's actually causing children to stumble. It's not just kind of absent-mindedly being a bit of a hindrance. It's actively causing them to stumble. So what Jesus is saying this is, he is saying, welcome children. Be active in your welcoming of children. So just imagine for me for a moment a continuum spanning from over here, causing children to stumble, to over there, welcoming children to come closer to Jesus. Where are we? Where are we as a church? Where are you? Where are your family? Where are those you're responsible for? On that continuum. So maybe if indifferent is kind of in the middle, just indifferent to children, it's like, oh, yeah, cool, glad they're here, that's good. Is that, is that different to what Jesus himself says about how we should view children in our midst? Because I think it is, and I think it's a challenge. Just imagine for a moment then, if I said that next week, back here, one quarter of all the people who are going to be here are of one specific demographic, and they don't know Jesus as their saviour yet. They're not Christians. One quarter. If I said I've got a quarter, I'm going I'm to bring a quarter of the number of people here, and they don't know Jesus. That's kind of the thing we should be doing as a church, right? We'd be excited about that prospect. If I could guarantee that that was going to happen next week, we'd probably think to ourselves, ooh, maybe I'll be a little bit more on the front foot with my welcome next week. I'll, I'll, I'll make a bit of an effort with those people, I think. Maybe we'd think, actually, I wonder if we should even gear the meeting slightly differently because that's a really great opportunity to invite those, those people to come to know Jesus. And that's exactly what happens every single week. In our, in our CARES meeting here, between a quarter and a third of the entire population of being here are 0 to 18s. That's why it feels a bit empty in here now, because they've all gone out to their groups. And the vast majority of them don't know Jesus yet. They know about Jesus. They know all sorts of stories and they do brilliant crafts about Jesus. But lots of them don't have a living and active relationship with him. If I was to tell you that if someone doesn't accept Jesus as their saviour by the time they are 14, they are statistically unlikely to do so in the rest of their life, what would it do in our hearts? What would it do with what we do here each week? Because that's the reality. So these the startling statistics that have been found by this group called the Barna Group. Um, it's a big kind of church research group in America. Um, and granted, it's in America, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of crossover here. But they basically summarize their findings like this. They say, the older a person gets without becoming a Christian, the less likely they ever are to do so. The reality is that after about 14, the likelihood of someone coming to faith in Jesus just drops off a cliff. This isn't a particularly kind of infusing talk for evangelism, I know. But some do. But what it says to me is that we have an incredible opportunity with young people to introduce them to something that will change their lives forever. The statistics are as well that if they do make a commitment and they do get stuck into a church by the time they're 14, they are far more likely to do that for the rest of their lives. It's an incredible thing. And so the greatest evangelistic opportunity we have as a church is every single week in this room and in those rooms out there and in the children that come to Life Church because a load of you lot bring them. It's an incredible opportunity. There is a mission field of very fertile soil right on our doorstep every single week and we have the privilege of being able to welcome them. That's all Jesus asks us to do. We can't make them do anything. If you've got children, you'll know that but we can welcome them to Jesus. Through the way that we even engage in church ourselves, we can be an example. We can model to them something of what it is to know Jesus, like it actually might make a difference in our lives. It's an incredible thing. So there's, there's two more things that I want us to see from this. The first is an encouragement, and then the second are some practical applications and kind of implications of this stuff. The first is this. In 1 John 3 verse 1, it says this, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, 
that we should be called children of God. Jesus welcomes children. He actively welcomes them. And then he says, and you know you're children of God too, right? All this stuff that I've just been saying about how, how important it is to welcome children, that applies to all of us in the same sense because we are all children of God. He is our good father and we are his children. You see, that is the most exciting thing there is to see about the way of Jesus with children. Not just for somebody else, but for you. Because the lavish love, as it says here, that is given to us through Jesus, through his sacrifice on our behalf, is that we get to be called children of God. With the, the best father you could ever possibly imagine. That is great news. It's, that is the kind of thing that should make our hearts sing. That is the kind of thing that should, that should propel us into a life of worship of God that is an example to those around us, that gives our children something to see in us because we are reveling in just being children of God. And it might be a while since you've remembered that truth, but it is wonderful, wonderful news. You see, my, my kids don't, don't question, I don't think, whether I love them or not. They don't question whether I'm for them or not. They don't question whether they're mine or not. Because, because I'm, their, I'm their dad. And as their dad, I find all sorts of ways to, to prove those things to them, to show them that I love them, that I'm for them, that they're mine, that they're, they're, they're a muncie. And God does the same with us. He finds all sorts of ways to reach out to you to say, you are mine. You are loved. Sometimes we need to look for them a little bit more. Sometimes we need to, to spot the ways in which he does that. But he wants you to know, even this morning, that, that if you've given your life to Jesus, then you are his. You are adopted into the most incredible family. You are a child of God. And that is great news. That really is great news. And so... And finally, I want us to, to kind of practically land this in some ways, which for all of us, we can do something about this. Whoever we are, because Jesus gives us all this responsibility. You'll notice he doesn't say, and parents, you should welcome children. He doesn't say that. He says, you, plural, everybody, all inclusive. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some people that have more responsibility than others for children. Okay, we're going we're gonna to see that. So um, and we're going we're gonna to do this in priority order, okay, and for most responsibility first. So parents, your children are your primary responsibility. And the only time we ever really hear about that in church at the moment is when we're saying out there, because it's a public building, your children are your responsibility. Please make sure they don't headbutt someone with a coffee. But this goes way further than that. And in particular, the Bible's really clear, dads... It's your responsibility first and foremost. Ephesians 6 and verse 4 makes this really clear. It says, fathers, don't exasperate your children, which is really easy to do when they're exasperating you. But bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So the verses preceding that say that they are to honour you as, as parents. They're to honour their mothers and fathers. But how are they supposed to do that if they don't know that that's even a thing? That's not inbuilt in children. Children can only know that they're supposed to honour their parents in this way because the Bible says it, and that's bringing them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So you need to do your bit first if you want your children to honour you. I'm not saying it's always going to work. It's not, it's, not, it's not just easy. Parenting is not easy. Look at the state of my face. But that is your bit to do to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And there has been a massive shift in societal thinking that makes us think, and it's mo I think this is seen most clearly in the education sector, is that it's somebody else's job. Okay, it's somebody else's, it's somebody else's job to do the things that are actually my responsibility. So it's, it's a school's job to educate a child. It's, just, it's my job to just get them there and back. And I don't think that's true. Don't think that's the, that's the view that the Bible gives us. Schools are an incredible resource and teachers are simply the most wonderful people in the entire world. I'm married to one of them. But it is not 
the school's job to educate your children. They do certain parts of it, and you trust them to do that. But I just, honestly, I pray that we never have that attitude in the church. If you are expecting me or the kids' work team that I help oversee to bring your child up in the training and instruction of the Lord, you have missed the point. They do a wonderful job out there, and I'm going to come to them in a minute. But it's not their responsibility to bring your children to Jesus. It's, it's your responsibility, dads particularly. It is your responsibility to bring your family to Jesus. And it is a big call. And it's just blinking hard work sometimes. But it is the most worthwhile thing you will ever do for your children. It is always our responsibility as parents. And so, uh, like I say, one of, the, one of the amazing ways we get to do that is bring them to church. And we have wonderful kids' work teams who serve you as parents and serve our children as wonderfully well as they can. But there are also things you can be doing to make, to make this work. Things in your home that you can be doing. So every week out of our Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2 groups, they will come home with a sheet that says family devotional on it that the team has spent time and thought going into it. There's some questions on there that you can talk through. It'll be related to what they've talked about in their groups. Most of the time, they're doing in their groups what we're doing in here in a much pr more profound way half the time. You can talk to them about it. You can find out. And they will say, you'll say to them, oh, what did you do in kids' work today? And they go, oh, I don't know. Because that's what kids do every single time. <laughs> that's why we're giving you a sheet to go, did you do something about this? And they'll go, oh, yes. And then you can talk about the craft that they've made, or you can talk about what, what it means to them. There's all sorts of ways you can engage with them. There are all sorts of other things you can do. So we give them a memory verse each time. Really simple, really accessible, that they can learn. And we can then help them to know the, the truth when it says, I've hidden your word in my heart, that I might not sin against you. You, you will not know the, the profound depths of just knowing the word of God and helping them to remember that. I still remember songs of verses I learned when I was a kid. And they come back to me. They come out at all sorts of moments. And you can help your kids do that. You can put those things on in the car. You can, you can find some great resources for those sorts of things. You can pray for your children. You can pray for other people's children. You can read the Bible with your children. You can even be enthusiastic about coming to church. You see, I think your attitude, and I know this is, this is tough, and I'm just, honestly, if you read my Facebook update, I'd said I've been in tears over this message because so much of this has spoken to me. The joy of a preacher is you have to do this yourself first, and I'm not, I've, not, I've not got all the way there, trust me. But this stuff matters. Your attitude towards the beloved bride of Christ, the church, it will not go unnoticed by your children. It just won't. And there's, there's something in us that we need, to, we need to fall in love with Jesus and fall in love with the church that he's in love with, sometimes all over again, because it is a glorious thing. And look, we, we as a church, as a team, we're working on all sorts of new and better ways to engage with your children on a Sunday morning through worship and through our kids' groups and things like that. We're, there's all sorts of bits that we're thinking about. But, you know, the best way to engage your children in worship on a Sunday morning is to worship with them on a Tuesday afternoon and to worship on a Thursday on the way home from swimming and to make worship part of family life so that it's not just something we do on a Sunday. It's, it's an extension of our, of our life and our week. But look, the reality is none of these things are going to save your children. <laughs> not, one of, not one of those individual things will cause your child to suddenly become completely compliant, the best, the best academic. It, just, it won't do that, but what it will do is it will welcome them into his presence, and that's all Jesus gives us to do. And so it's an important thing for us to do. You can, you can bring them to Jesus. And there is literally no greater gift you could give your child than that. 
It is the ultimate prize. And the, the church and the leaders in the church here are here to equip you for your works of ministry. It tells us this in Ephesians 4, right? The, the role of a church leader and all the different gifts that we have in the church is to equip you for works of service, for your ministry. And if you're a parent, there is no bigger ministry you have than your children. They are number one. They have to be number one. I've got a little leaflet that is a, a mini version of this, this book here. By, 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 um, it's called Paul David Tripp, and it's basically grace-filled parenting. 14 gospel principles that can radically change your family. Some of them might. And it's just a tiny little thing. And if, and if it just encourages you for a moment to think, actually, yeah, this, I can take grace into my parenting, which we all need, then I pray that it does that for you. Um, but that's, that's the kind of, the point is, we are here to equip you in all sorts of ways. And so that's what it should do. That's why every single week we will turn our eyes back to Jesus through worship, through what we preach from here, because looking to him is what we need in our parenting. It's what we need in our friendships. It's what we need in our workplace. It's what we need in our just getting out of bed in the morning. But that's why we do what we do. So I've got, I've got this book and I've got another one, which is called Family Discipleship by Matt Chandler and Adam Griffin. Um, I've read bits of both of them, but not the whole thing. Um, and there's somebody's to take away. There is a little proviso, though, okay? I, want, I don't want these to be still here by the, by the end of the morning. Somebody take them. Um, but the deal is this. You've got to read it. And then you've got to do something with some of the bits that stand out to you. So after you're finished with this book, I would love this book to go to somebody else. And it's got your scribbles and your highlights and maybe your tears inside it because it'll then go to somebody else and it'll make a difference in their life. So the idea is you read it, you do something about it, and you pass it on. It's a good idea, isn't it? So you can, you can take those, um, and it will do your children good, but it will also do our church good, which gives glory to God. That's the point. The next group in an order of priority, I think, are our kids workers and our youth teams, who are out there doing a wonderful job, and some of you are in here. And they are an incredible bunch of people. They are just the best and it is one of my greatest joys to get to work with our children's teams um, some of them will be listening back and because they're outside surfing right now um, and I want you to know if you have ever served on our kids team and if you're on our kids teams right now I am profoundly grateful for the work you do lots of us are in here are profoundly grateful for the incredible work you do these these, these teams have been one of the only teams that has continued throughout the last two, two years of a pandemic. Week in, week out, online kids work and chatting to people and just making everything they can do to welcome children towards Jesus part of church life. And I would love you to find a moment to thank somebody. If you know one of the kids workers, maybe it'll be one of the ones out there, maybe it'll be someone in here, I would love you to find a way to say thank you. We could do a round of applause in here. Yeah, yeah we could. Absolutely. But do you know something? If you were to go and just tell them one of the differences they've made, that would be an incredible thing. If you want to give them a gift, give them a gift. Just find a way to say thank you. And like I say, if, you are, if you're already part of one of our real-life kids teams, can I just encourage you with the words that Paul uses in Galatians? He says this, let us not become weary in doing good. It's really easy to become weary when you're serving week in, week out, but the difference you are making is eternal. It says, let us not grow weary or become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. I want you to keep going. Because at the proper time, we will reap a harvest. So I'm praying that one of the, one of the things that happens in our church is that we reap a harvest of swathes of children who are 0 to 18 coming to know Jesus as their saviour. That is the best harvest there could ever possibly be. I would love to think that in, just in, the next, in the coming months or years, we are baptizing so many of our young people because they're saying, Jesus is my king, and I want everyone to know it. And then finally, all of us, whether you're young and single, whether you're old and widowed, whether you're middle-aged and childless, or whether you're parents, this is all of us. What can you do to welcome children in the way of Jesus? How can you be more like him? That's basically all we do every Sunday at church. How can you be more like Jesus? And this is one of the ways that he 
lived. He welcomed children. So I want to tell you about a couple called Olive and Albert Lord. Okay? When I was a kid growing up in Poynton Baptist Church, they were in their 70s or 80s. Okay? So they, like, they were ancient to me. Sorry. But when I was a kid, they were. And honestly, they played a fairly significant part of why I went to church each week. And it was a highly spiritual thing. Because Olive would occasionally give me 20p. And Albert always had fruit pastels. Every single week. Like, always. He always had fruit pastels. And he would make sure I had more than one of them. And when I was seven or eight, that's enough reason. That's as good as reason as any to go back to church the next week. Might get 20p. Might, might even get some fruit pastels from Albert. And... Honestly, when I look back now, knowing that I was just part of church community, I didn't understand everything. I didn't join in with most of the songs. And when I was going through puberty, my voice broke and I couldn't work out which pitch I was supposed to be singing it in. And it's just, it's, the whole thing's a nightmare. But being part of that community, week in, week out, stood me in good stead. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now if it wasn't for people like Oliver and Albert Lord. And you can be those kind of people. And... Well, honestly, in my teenage years, I had every reason for my life to go completely off the rails. I had, I had loads of good excuses for why I could have done, apart from just being a teenager. But knowing the community that I was part of, knowing the people that loved me, were for me, would speak to me, cared about me, made me come back to be part of the community of church, which helped me to see Jesus, which helped me to see that he makes a difference in my life, in the tough stuff. And I think in our day, we can be incredibly cynical about people just being kind to children. And it's a sad thing. And if I, it just even saying something like an older man in the church sharing sweets with a young child makes us go, oh gosh, really? But that's, that's not a gospel attitude. Now look, we, we have robust safeguarding procedures as part of Life Church. We want your children to be as safe as they can possibly be. And we act on them strongly when we need to. I want you to be under no illusions. Part of my job is to, to both lead us and preach to us and things, but it's also to fiercely protect every single one of us against anyone who would cause harm. And I do so. All of our elders do so. But... You know, we can be a community where children and young people feel safe. And there's not many places like that in the world anymore. But the church can be a radically different place. You know, I sent a message to a couple of people during the week, because I literally was just, like, with tears rolling down my face, thinking about two guys in particular who have made a difference to loads of kids in our church just by being people who will wrestle with them and let them climb all over them when their parents are too tired to do so. <laughs> and the example that they, of, of just loving children like Jesus did is an incredible thing. And you might have counted yourself out, but both of those people are, don't have children of their own and yet are in a better example of sometimes how to love children like Jesus did than, than examples I've seen in most other places. It is a community thing. So, look, there are, there are things you can do that might just make a child want to come to church next week or might just make it easier for a parent to bring their child to church next week. And it can make all the difference. So, it might not, I don't think it should involve everyone bringing fruit pastels to, to church. I don't think parents are going to thank us for, for loading their children with sugar just before lunch. But it might be. Okay, maybe, that, maybe that's the thing for you. But next time you're chatting to a parent over a coffee and there's a child hanging on the bottom of their cardigan, why not talk to the child for a bit? Or just acknowledge that they're there rather than kind of getting through all the admin that you've got to get done at church that week. Why not make an effort to, to find out their name? Tell them something about you. So often I, I go to children and I say, so tell me, what have you been doing? And they go... I don't really want to talk to you. My kids find that. If you come and talk to my children, you, you'll probably get nothing. But tell them about you, and they'll listen. 
and then they'll find out and then the next time they tell them a bit more about you and they'll find out a bit more about you and then maybe one day they'll talk to you. I don't know, maybe they won't. But you can, you can engage with children. I'm giving you permission to engage with children. You can comment on the craft that they are, you know, they've crushed in their fingers after they come out of kids' group. Ask them about it. Find out what they did. Say it looks brilliant. And then next week, I bet you they come and show you their craft next week is too. And then you're going to have to say it's brilliant as well, even if it's just a painted piece of pasta. But you can get on their level. You can be friendly and kind to children. Jesus was friendly and kind to children. Can you imagine that moment when Jesus is talking with his disciples and he takes a child and places the child among them? He must have been trustworthy. It wasn't his child. It wasn't one of the disciples' children. And yet someone trusted him to go, okay, yeah, of course you can go with Jesus. We can be those people. You know, parents, you can invite people from church around to your house in the midst of real everyday life just with children. You can just let them be part of the chaos. They might even help. You can let them be part of your children's lives, and I promise every single one of us will be richer for it. We really, really will. And I think for some of us, just as I've been talking this morning, this is igniting in you, or it's reigniting in you, a passion for seeing children be welcomed towards Jesus. And so there are, there are some things you can do. You can, you can sign up to get involved with one of our kids' teams. That's, that's not what this has all been driving towards. This isn't a, a recruitment plug. But do you know what? It will make an eternal difference. You can do it today. We can get your DBS sorted ASAP and you can be part of shaping lives for a future that has Jesus at the center of it. But maybe also you could just commit to praying for children. I was talking to my mother-in-law and, and she was telling me about a lady in her church who would ask for an updated list of all the children who came to church every three months. An incredible lady called Jean Hammond who faithfully prayed for children. And when a name dropped off the list, between those three months you'd go and say, where, where have they been? Where have they gone? How can we, how can we help? You can, make, you can make a difference. I know that for me, I, I grew up with Auntie Lynn and Uncle Bob, not actually related to me, northern, northern aunties and uncles, who prayed for me every week. Who, they, they led kids' work every single week without fail. They took us away on camps in the summer and they never had children of their own. They made a profound difference to hundreds and hundreds of children and families. And I thank God for them. You know, if we pray for our children, I'm confident that Jesus will do more than we can possibly ask or imagine. We could, honestly, it could change the whole city of Southampton. It really could. Even if we just start with the ones we've got, with yours and mine, it will change the world. And look, if there's something else that you've got in mind of a way you can serve children in our church, then, then come and let's talk about it. Even if it's just something that actually will help us to avoid hindering them inadvertently, I'd love to talk to you about that. You can, you can email me, we can meet up, or whatever it might be, I don't mind. And look, I, I've, got, I've got loads more I could say about this whole topic. I, I, there's something else later in the year, I'm going to come back to this stuff. But for now, I want to can you just stand with me? Because I want to pray about this. And if there's, if there's something for you that kind of just made your heart go, oh, this morning, if there's like some, a passion in you that's going, I need to do something... Even while I'm praying or while we're worshipping in just a second, can you just nudge the person next to you and say this? Ask me afterwards what I need to do about this. Because by the time you get out there, it will have subsided. You'll have sung a song and you'll have gone, oh yeah, that was, yeah, really? Yeah, so I said some really powerful things this morning. But if someone else is going to say, Are you, what do you need to do then? It'll make you do something and that will actually cause the change. Don't just let it be a good intention or a good idea or like a, a little feeling inside where you're like, oh, maybe I should. Actually do something. But let's pray. Father, I thank you that we are your children. That you have adopted us into your family, that you have made a way for us to be called children of God. Sons and daughters loved by the most perfect father. 
Lord, I just thank you for what a privilege it is to, to know you and to be known by you. And Lord, what a, what a joy it is to be able to share that good news with all sorts of people around us, and particularly our children and young people. And Lord, we thank you for the children who are part of Life Church. Lord, I thank you for their parents. I thank you for all of those who are involved in their lives. I thank you for our kids' workers. Lord, I thank you that this is a place where people can be brought to a knowledge of you. And I pray that you'll help us. Lord, take us forward in these things. Lord, I pray that many of our children will get saved. Lord, that they will come to know you. And as they do that, Lord, they will invite their friends to come and see this God who's changed everything. Lord, I want to pray that there will be a, a change in our attitudes where it needs to change towards children. Lord, let us never disregard children. But Lord, also keep us from making them an idol. Lord, spare us from seeing children as a commodity in this world. Lord, help us to see them like you see them. Help us to become like them. Lord, we want to be changed by your Holy Spirit. We want to be more like you in the way that you love children. Come and help us. We need your help. Amen.